so you have uh, von Neumann algebra, so a von Neumann algebra is a uh, star subalgebra of B of H for H a Hilbert space, so your bounded operators on a Hilbert space. You have a star subalgebra B of, B of H. Uh, let me give it a name M as a star subalgebra M of B of H, uh, such that the uh, it contains the identity element and uh, so star means it's closed under taking um, ad adjoints. And of course, the mo most crucial property is uh, M is closed in the uh, strong operator topology. Uh, which is just the pointwise convergence. Uh, as whenever you apply them to a vector, if you have a net of operators, they converge strongly to another operator. If for each vector you apply them to, that net of vectors course converges to the operator applied to those vectors. Uh, and the Hilbert space norm. Um, so that's the definition of a von Neumann algebra. And then there's a theorem of von Neumann, uh, um, very famous theorem from 1929, I believe, uh, so almost 100 years ago, which says that if M, a star subalgebra of B of H, uh, and one is contained in M, then M is SOT closed, or in other words, is a von Neumann algebra, if and only if M is equal to its own by commutant. This is where any set, the commutant is by definition the set of operators T and B of H, such that they commute. So the double centralizer for S and S. So that's the definition of a commutant. And von Neumann showed that your SOT closed if and only if you're equal to your by commutant, assuming your stars of algebra containing the identity. Uh, so this is another way that you often see them defined. Now for us, the main examples of von Neumann algebra, so a von Neumann algebra is finite. A von Neumann algebra is finite if uh, whenever you have an operator V, if you have V star V equals one, then that implies V V star equals one. Uh, the terminology comes from the fact that we think of uh, v, v, we think of V an operator V as being kind of a, a non-commutative function and V star V is the range and V V star is like the domain. And so what this is a, a non-commutative phrasing is it's a non-commutative way of saying that if you are have an injective function to a subset, then it is automatically surjective, which is exactly the definition of a finite set. If you have an injective function from a set to itself, then it has to be surjective. That, that characterizes finite sets. Uh, so that's where the terminology comes from, why they're called finite. And then uh, there's another theorem, uh, which is again due to Murray and von Neumann, which is sometime in the 30s, I believe, uh, 36 maybe or 38, uh, which says that um, a separable, so this is SOT topology or, or um, uh, SOT may depend on the Hilbert space. So maybe some sigma weak OT or something, but it doesn't matter, separable is the same. Uh, SOT separable von Neumann algebra is finite, algebra n is, is finite, if and only if there exists a uh, faithful, normal uh, tracial state. So 
uh, let me give it a name, call it tau. So faithful means tau of x star x equals zero implies uh, x is equal to zero. So that's faithful. Normal means SOT continuous. Uh, and tracial means that the trace of xy should be equal to the trace of yx. And of course, state just means that the trace of x star x is always greater than or equal to zero. Um, okay, so that's uh, so that's a finite von Neumann algebra. If you, as long as you restrict to separable situations, uh, then you you get uh, this characterization. The state also requires that the norm is one, right? The norm of the traces. Oh yeah, and per state, the other condition of state. So it's positive and then tau of one is one. Thank you. Um, yeah, let's see. So that's, uh, so for for us, we'll only care about separable, the separable case. So this is this is the definition you take. And the non-separable setting, it's, it's almost, this statement is almost true in the non-separable setting. Uh, it's really actually only if the center is separable in the SOT, then, then this is true. And, uh, and so you have to worry about things like L infinity of the real numbers, little L infinity of the real numbers. This is a finite von Neumann algebra, but it has no faithful normal tracial state. Uh, um, okay, so you have to worry about situations like this in general. But as long as you restrict to say, if the center of the von Neumann algebra is SOT separable, then this theorem applies there as well. Uh, and then for the natural example, which will work for our class, is that if gamma is a group, I already mentioned this before, if gamma is a group, um, so then the group algebra naturally sits inside of bounded operators on L2 of the group by the left regular representation. And so the group von Neumann algebra, usually denoted L gamma, is by definition the SOT closure of this star subalgebra. So this is a unital star subalgebra. The group algebra is a unital star subalgebra of B of L2. And this is the um, this is the von Neumann, group von Neumann algebra. And then you can check that the trace in this case, there's a natural, so this is finite because it's the natural, there's a natural trace, uh, which is the trace of X is just, it's given by a vector state. It's X and delta E delta E. So because it's a vector state, it's definitely a state. Uh, it's definitely normal because by definition, this von Neumann algebra is, is a subalgebra of of, I mean, vector states are always normal on B of L2. Uh, and it's um, uh, faith, showing it's faithful is a good exercise and showing it's trace, tracial are, are both good exercises. Um, um, so that's a fun thing to do. You can prove both of them with no more than like two or three lines. So, you know, so this is the group von Neumann algebra. Uh, and there's a lot of interest in classifying group von Neumann algebra. So you start with a group, you get a von Neumann algebra, and there's a lot of interest in classifying these. All right, and we'll do some of it. We already did one example. We shot, we saw that this von Neumann algebra is amenable if and only if the group is amenable. So we see that there's some connection between the group and the group von Neumann algebra. Uh, maybe one more example. So this is not part of today's lecture, any of this, but I'm starting to bleed into the into time. Uh, one example is, maybe I'll put the example up here, let's have a little more room, is that if gamma is abelian, so then of course we saw that the uh, C star algebra, the reduced C star algebra of gamma, or which is isomorphic to the full C star algebra, via Fourier transform, this is isomorphic to continuous functions on the Pontryagin dual, while a similar situation holds with the von Neumann algebra, then in that case, the von Neumann algebra, L gamma, is isomorphic to L infinity functions on the Pontryagin dual with respect to hard measure. Um, so, and of course, in this situation, you have these natural inclusions uh, here. Yeah, so that's maybe to give some intuition if you've never seen group von Neumann algebras before, 
in the abelian case, they're kind of like L infinity functions of the dual group. So in the non abelian case, we think of them as like still like L infinity functions of the dual group, but we can't actually write down the dual group because it doesn't exist. So, so it's like a non commutative L infinity space of the dual. That's, that's how we should tell things. All right. So that was maybe a bit more than you were asking, but it's, they're going to definitely come up in the course a number of times. So it makes sense to go over it. Okay. Uh, now I think everybody's here. Uh, any other questions before I pick up from where we left off last time? All right. Let me see. Where did we let leave off last time? So we introduced this notion of uh, positive type kernels or positive definite kernels right here. So if you have a set, we say that the uh, kernel is of positive type if this matrix is always non-negative definite. And then we have this GNS type construction. And then my uh, pencil ran out of batteries just before I could say that if you have a group, then we'll say that a function on the group is of positive type if the map uh, going from gamma times gamma, so st, and sending it to phi of t inverse s uh, is a positive type. And in this situation, of course, the group gamma acts on itself by left multiplication. And so you see qu quite nicely that this positive type kernel is invariant with respect to the group action because we have an s here and a t inverse here. So if you put a gamma s gamma t, you would get the same thing. Uh, and so what this means is this means that this Hilbert space that we constructed with the GNS construction uh, will be, again, there'll be a gamma action on it and the inner product will be gamma invariant. In other words, we get a representation. And this is the usual GNS construction for uh, positive type functions on group. So we see that Again, we have this GNS construction that uh, if phi is positive type, so then this is an if and only if, I guess. Uh, if we have any function on the group that's of positive type, if and only if uh, there exists a unitary representation pi from gamma to u of h, and there exists some vector c and h such that phi of t is equal to pi t c inner product with c. And this, uh, yeah, I'll leave to you guys. It's, it's exactly, you can just notice that the representation coming from positive type functions is g invariant, so that gives us a representation or you can just rewrite the proof uh, and you'll see we get this. All right. Um, so they correspond to representations, uh, which means that we should immediately think of property T because property T corresponds to representations having almost invariant vectors. Uh, and indeed we'll see the connection of property T in just a moment. A. Uh, that. All right, so here's another definition for kernels. So again, S a set. So a map, let me give it a different name this time, C, mapping, mapping S times S. Uh, and this time I'll require it goes to the real numbers to make life easier, uh, is of conditionally negative type. If, so it's gonna be a very uh, similar statement as I gave for positive type, except well, we'll want something less than or equal to zero and uh, there'll be a condition. So uh, the condition uh, will be that we'll only look at vectors who, which sum to zero when we look at the negative condition. So specifically, 
if for all uh, alpha one through alpha n real numbers and for all um, s1 through sn and s. Uh, so one more, I forgot to write the condition. All alpha n through alpha one through alpha n real numbers such that the sum of alpha i is equal to zero. That's the condition. And for all s1 through sn and s, we have that this sum as i and j goes from one to n of alpha j alpha i c of s i s j is less than or equal to zero. All right, so if you just drop this and drop this condition right here, then you would exactly get that this is just the negative of a positive type function. Okay, so um, just like with the uh, maybe a, a couple quick quick observations. Uh, oh, one corollary I meant to write, but I forgot it. Hmm, now I've run out of room. So this is a corollary here of this GNS construction is that if, so this is Schur's lemma. So if phi one and phi two are of positive type, uh, so then V one times V two is of positive type. Uh, this is for kernels, so also for functions, but uh, here's the proof, and that is that we know that uh, phi i of st is of the form inner product c i s with c i t for some functions c mapping s to Hilbert space. Um, and so then what we can do is we can just write uh, phi 1 uh, of st times phi 2 of st is just the inner product of c1 s tensor c2 s with c1 t tensor c2 t and the tensor product Hilbert space. So that's the proof for that. Okay, that's one corollary I just forgot to write. All right, so now we have uh, this conditionally negative type function. Uh, so I here I've given the definition and just like with positive type functions, there's also a GNS type construction here uh, related to mappings in the Hilbert space. And so let's go ahead and prove that. Uh, what's called a proposition. And that is that uh, if, I uh, don't want to add any assumptions here. No. So if C maps S times S to the reals, then C is conditionally of negative type, negative type. If and only if there exists a Hilbert space H and a map. Uh, let me give it a different name. How about eta from S to H? such that C of ST is equal to the norm of eta S minus eta T squared. So this is the GNS type construction for uh, kernels of conditionally negative type. And so let's go ahead and give a proof of this. Can, can yeah. I ask you a question? Um, yeah. So, um, I think I, I have seen this definition, but with, uh, so these alpha, alphas come from like, uh, from complex numbers. Yeah, um, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna stick to real numbers just to make my life a little bit easier and make some of the statements if and only if statements. Oh, okay. So the, the proposition you're giving, like the, the Hilbert space, it, it can be choosen, chosen so that it's- Well, as you can see, of course, uh, so the only if, portion, in particular, the function you get out will be real valued because it'll be the norm of something. Right. So if you want this condition, 
uh, yeah, maybe if you allow complex valued functions, then this proposition doesn't doesn't hold. So that's why I'll restrict to real real valued functions. Oh, okay. So this Hilbert space is a uh, it's a complex Hilbert space. Yeah, it'll be a complex Hilbert space. Of course, oh, okay. if it were a real Hilbert space, then you could always embed it inside a complex Hilbert space. So that's not. not right, right, right. Uh, I mean, you can make it a real Hilbert space also, sure. All right. Uh, so the proof of this is as follows. Uh, so again, one direction should be easier, mainly this direction. Uh, so if we have a function defined of this type, then we just have to compute this sum. Uh, sum over i and j goes from one up to n of alpha j alpha i. Uh, and now we have norm eta s i minus eta s j squared. And then we uh, expand this out using the inner product with itself. So this is equal to the sum over i and j goes from one to n. And now we're gonna have alpha j alpha i, and we'll have eta s i norm squared uh, minus twice the real part of eta s i eta s j. I guess if you were in a real Hilbert space, you wouldn't put the real part here, but that's okay. Uh, and then plus the norm of eta s j squared. All right. And so now what we see happens is that this term here has only an i in it. And so when we sum over i and j, we'll get the sum of the alpha j's, which is equal to uh, zero, right? That was that assumption there. So this term here will get will contribute zero. And similarly, this term only has a j in it. So when we sum over the alpha i's, we're gonna get zero. So the only term that's gonna come out is this middle term. And then we can put the alpha j's together with the alpha i's. So we get that this is uh, negative twice the real part of the sum as uh, i, well, maybe. Uh, yeah, let me keep the sums outside. Maybe we'll stick them inside in a moment. Uh, so this is the sum as i and j goes from one to n. And now we have negative twice the real part of alpha i uh, eta um, s i. And here we have alpha j eta s j. Uh, and now what do we see? We see that now we can put the sums inside and we just get the norm of something. So this is negative two times the real part of the norm, but the norm is always positive, so we don't need the real part anymore. Sum over i of alpha i eta s i squared, which is less than or equal to zero. So that shows that any map of this form is, is clearly a map of conditionally negative type. And now we have to prove the converse. So sorry about um, one of the problems with doing everything online is that you can't just like put the board to the side and, and have it. So I guess you guys could take a screenshot if you want. Um, all right. So here's the converse of this. Uh, so that was that direction. So now we're going to prove this direction. So if you're of conditionally negative type, then you are of this form. And it's again, we're going to do a similar thing where we're going to use the, the formula for a negative type to give us an inner product. So specifically, the, the space we're going to get an inner product on is we're going to consider um, uh, C, so let me call it C sub zero of S. So this will be the set of all linear combinations of S, sum of alpha i, i goes from one to n of S i, such that the sum of alpha i is equal to zero. So it's linear combinations that the sum of the coefficients is zero. So this is a perfectly nice vector space. And on this, uh, we define on this vector space, we define an inner product, so alpha s i over sum beta j 
T to J, J goes from one to M, C, and this is just equal to the sum as I goes from one to N, uh, sum J goes from one to M, uh, alpha I, beta J bar maybe, ah, okay, maybe we do want a real Hilbert space here. Real, real, and then I don't need to take time to get there. Uh, and now we have here C of SI TJ. And of course, uh, of course, that's negative. That's going to give us what we don't want. So maybe we take the negative here, and maybe I'll take a negative one half to make life easier. Uh, okay, so this is now a bilinear form on this vector space and then we can see uh, the conditionally negative epping condition exactly says that this is a non-negative definite bilinear form and hence again we can take the quotient by the kernel of this and then take the completion and so we get this uh, Hilbert space here uh, h is going to be the closure and completion of this. So this will be a real Hilbert space, uh, not a complex Hilbert space. But like I said before, you can always embed it into a complex Hilbert space in the end if you want. All right, so this is a real Hilbert space. So this is the completion with respect to this inner product. So that's our Hilbert space and now we just need the map. So the map uh, eta mapping S to H is just going to be defined by uh, so defined by uh, eta. Well, we're going to fix. I need to add myself a little more room here. We're just going to go ahead and fix any point. Fix some s naught and s, and now we're going to define this map eta by eta of S is just going to be, we're going to look at S minus S naught and look at the equivalence class corresponding that. So I needed S naught so that the sum of the coefficients is zero, right? One, one minus one is zero. So that this indeed lives in this Hilbert space H. And then uh, all we have to do is check what is the norm of eta S minus eta T squared and we see that this is exactly equal to um so this is here we have s minus s naught minus t minus naught squared but then um uh, so this is the same as the norm of s minus t squared and now we just uh, compute the inner product according to our formula. So uh, again this is just this vector inner product itself and then we go to the formula for the uh, inner product which is up here and we see that this is going to be what negative one half. We're going to have a C of S S. Uh, we're going to have um, plus, and then we're going to have one half, but then times two. So we're going to have C S T, and then we're going to have another minus one half C T T. And now I see maybe I forgot one condition. Yeah, I see that I forgot one condition. Apologies. But in my definition, I also want to make my life easier. So this map uh, I will always assume uh, C is symmetric, so SME of ST is equal to C of TS, and that C of SS is always equal to zero. So sorry about that, I forgot that that's part of the definition of a conditionally negative type function. No. So you can verify quite easily that this function indeed satisfies that condition, if you replace switch S and T, then you get the same norm. And if you set S equal to T, you get zero. 
And now I'm going to use that because here, I should have said this is really the real, uh, here this is, oh, this is plus C S T one half plus one half C T S. So that's the formula for the inner product. But now we see that this part is zero, this part is zero, and this part, these are one half of the same thing. So this is C of ST. All right, so I do definitely want this condition that on the diagonal, these Cs are zero and these are also symmetric. So I'm only gonna talk about uh, these, these situations. So we get this if and only if statement. I have one question. Yes. Uh, I mean, what's the geometrical, what geometrically what's going on here? Because I feel like if S is a finite set, I mean, then this, um, like our Hilbert space is like a hyperplane. And I uh, like so it's just, I mean, it'll be finite, finite dimensions in that case. Uh, yeah. But if you like, I mean, the, the kernels of negative types are really just uh, norm squares. Uh, it's just the, it's just the norm squared. So it's the distance squared between two points. And you can do this in diff other metric spaces as well. Um, but it, it, I don't know, it has like a feeling of like a, an alternating form or something like that. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Okay. All right, but uh, I do know one when you consider a group uh, this has another particular nice description. Uh, so what happens when, when we have a group? So again, uh, C, so gamma group. Uh, C mapping gamma, a real valued function uh, is of conditionally negative type. Uh, if, let me make sure I'm not forgetting, maybe I need the extra condition that it's zero at the identity or something, let me check. Uh, Oh yeah, no, it's saying this before. Okay, it's conditionally of negative type. If the, the kernel, which takes, again, gamma times gamma, here we take uh, S T and or, yeah, we send it to C of T versus S uh, is conditionally of negative type. So that's the definition of a conditionally negative type function on a group. And again, you can do the same thing as you do before. And you notice that uh, because of this, so this conditionally negative type kernel is invariant under the left action of the group. And so that means that this inner product we define here will be a gamma invariant uh, inner product, which means we get a unitary representation on this Hilbert space. So again, we get a unitary representation. And then if you take S naught to be the identity, uh, we get this map from our group into this Hilbert space, which satisfies this nice property that it is a co-cycle. Uh, so what have we shown in this case? Uh, if uh, C mapping gamma to the real numbers uh, is of conditionally negative type, So then there exists a representation uh, pi mapping gamma to unitary group of H, or actually since this is a real Hilbert space, we actually get an orthogonal representation, uh, but any orthogonal representation, you can just complexify it, but maybe let me write orthogonal because that's what you usually see in the literature. So this is an orthogonal representation on a real Hilbert space uh, and a uh, 
map C mapping gamma to this Hilbert space, uh, a co-cycle. So, and what is a co-cycle here? Co-cycle is just any map which satisfies the identity C of ST is equal to uh, C of S plus pi of S C of T. So that is a co-cycle. Is a co and a co-cycle such that C of T is equal to the norm of the co-cycle value of the co-cycle squared. Uh, so that's what we've just shown. Uh, why is that? That's because, so the proof of this is we just take this uh, Hilbert space that we construct before. I already mentioned that it's, uh, you get a representation on it. And you just notice that in this case, if you just set C of T to be exactly T minus the identity, uh, then this satisfies the co-cycle relation. This is a co-cycle. And C of uh, T, this is just, oh, this is a co-cycle. It also satisfies C so that the identity is zero. And C of T, this is, well, this is C of the inverse T, which is the norm of C of T minus C of E squared, which is just the norm of C of T squared. Right, so any conditionally negative type function on the group uh, exactly corresponds to uh, uh, orthogonal representation and a co-cycle such that it's just the norm of the co-cycle squared. And like I said before, you can just complexify the Silber space if you want a unitary representation, that's fine. Uh, conversely, if you have a co-cycle, just any map satisfying this relation, then you also get a conditionally negative type function with the same formula. So conversely, conversely, if uh, C mapping gamma to H is a co-cycle, so then, what do we see? We see that in this case, uh, let's look at the map sending it to T inverse S. So we want to claim that this is a conditionally negative type kernel. That's what we need to compute. Um, yes. Regarding co-cycles, is it a co-cycle always related to an action of the group? I mean, or uh, yes. So for a co-cycle, this is my definition for a co-cycle of a co-cycle is when you have a representation, so you notice pi here, so we have a representation on a Hilbert space. A co-cycle is a map which satisfies this formula. This is the co-cycle identity. So a co-cycle, before you have a co-cycle, you need a representation of the- Yes. Okay. Yeah, so it comes with the representation, absolutely. All right, so, and then, yeah, what I said conversely, if we have a representation, and if this is a co-cycle, maybe I should be explicit and say for pi, our representation for some representation pi, then we can compute the norm of the co-cycle of T inverse S, and this is equal to, well, we use the co-cycle identity to say that this is C of T inverse plus pi of T inverse C of S, and that's the co-cycle identity. Now we use the fact that it's a unitary representation, so we can pull out this pi of t inverse, and this is uh, c of s plus pi of t, c of t inverse squared. So I just used that, that's, that's a unitary representation. And then you use the co-cycle identity again, this time with t and t inverse, and you see that pi of t, c of t inverse is the same as negative c of t. So this is c of s minus c of t squared, which is conditional negative type.
All right, so we see that any co-cycle on the group for any representation gives us a conditional and negative type function. And conversely, any conditional and negative type function gives us a co-cycle. All right, there's one more ingredient I want before we give uh, new formulations to property T. And this is uh, Schoenberg's theorem. Uh, let's see, are, are we ready to prove this now? I think so. Um, yeah, so this is theorem. Schoenberg, that is that if C, so here we have gamma group, gamma group, uh, and C a mapping from gamma to the real numbers. Uh, so then, uh, I don't think I need to put any conditions here about C being positive valued or something. Let me double make sure. Uh, actually, we can do this. This is not even groups, just sets. So S set, C mapping S times S to the reals. Again, C on the diagonal is zero and C is symmetric. So then C is conditionally of negative type. If and only if, uh, for all, uh, I want to say positive real number. I don't want to say T because I've already been using T for elements of the set S. Uh, how about A? For all A greater than zero, uh, the map uh, exponential of negative A times C is a positive type. All right, so this gives us a dictionary between conditionally negative type functions and uh, one parameter families of positive type functions. And so let's see, we can prove this. And uh, maybe before we prove this, we'll need a couple lemmas. So here's one lemma. So one is that if phi mapping S times S to the complex numbers is of positive type. Um, so then the map which takes ST and sends it to phi SS minus twice the real part of phi st uh, plus phi t t is conditionally a negative type. So conditionally negative type. So that's the first lemma. Uh, let's go ahead and prove this. This is really easy because we know uh, by the GNS construction that V of ST is of this form right here, C S C T for some where C is a function of mapping S to some Hilbert space. And so then we just look at this formula. So then uh, this S S minus twice the real part. I mean, it almost looks like an inner product type thing. T plus V T T is equal to the norm of C S squared minus twice the real part of the inner product of C S 
CT uh, plus the norm of CT squared, which you recognize as just CS minus CT squared, which is of conditionally negative type. All right, so that's the proof of that elementary lemma. And now I have one more elementary lemma, which is going the other way around. So lemma, if C mapping S times S to the reals is of conditionally negative type. So then this map, which takes, oh, and if we fix the point, uh, and if it's not an S is fixed, so then this maps which takes ST and sends it to C, uh, no more, uh, S not S minus CST plus CT S not is a positive type. And this has an almost equally easy proof. Uh, again, you just use the GNS uh, formulation for this, and we see exactly what is this formula here. It's just going to be exactly the norm of some eta s naught minus eta s squared minus the norm of eta s minus eta t squared plus the norm of eta t minus eta s naught squared. And now you just start collecting terms. And, uh, and for the sake of time, maybe I'll just write it out. So this is just twice uh, the real part of C s or eta, eta s minus eta s not with eta t minus eta t not. Uh, and again, we could take a, a um, we don't even need to take the real part because of course this is an orthogonal uh, representation that uh, these eta's then map into. Uh, so there's no, we can forget, we can take an, an orthogonal representation if we want. So we get that without the reals or leave the reals, it doesn't matter. Um, okay, so you can stare at that for a moment and verify that that formula should be correct that I've written down, this is elementary. All right, so using these two lemmas, I can now prove to you uh, Schoenberg's theorem. So, um, you know, I need to go on to a new page. All right, sorry about constantly erasing what I've just written, uh, but let's go on to a new page and we can prove Schoenberg's theorem. So proof. Uh, so one direction is easier, and that is that if uh, exponential of negative a c is of positive type, Well then, what can you do? Well here, I wanna use this first lemma here. So if you have a function of positive type, then you can look at this new function, which is uh, take the value at S, SS minus twice the real part of PST and take add the PT, and you get conditionally negative types. So when we do that to this function here, we get therefore uh, this function which takes ST, and sends it to exponential, uh, let me just save room here, right? E minus A C 
SS um, uh, plus twice the real part. Well, it's a positive function. We don't need to say real part. So plus twice E negative A C S T um, minus, I guess this should be, one of these should be minus, yeah. Uh, this one should be minus. Minus and then plus E minus A um, C T T. So this is of conditional negative type. Uh, but C at the diagonal was zero. So that's just E to the zero, that's one. So this whole thing right here is just equal to, I guess, two, one minus E to the negative A C S T. Um, and now what we can do is we can divide by A. So of course, dividing multiplying by a constant doesn't change uh, changes this equality, but it doesn't change the fact that it's uh, conditionally negative type. So we get this is conditionally negative type for all A. So conditionally negative type. And, of, and uh, you can check directly from the definition of conditionally negative type that is closed under pointwise limits. So now we take the limit as A goes to zero. So therefore, C, which is just the limit as A goes to zero of twice one minus E to the minus A C over A uh, is of conditional negative type. All right, so that proves one direction. If the exponentials are all of positive type, then the map uh, C itself is condi of conditionally negative type. Now we have the other direction. So um, if C is um, uh, of conditionally negative type, so I want to prove to you that the exponentials are of positive type. Uh, so what I'll do there is I noticed before that if we consider so let's fix some S naught and S. And so then we have that this map uh, C S naught S minus C S T plus C T S naught is a positive type. We'll prove that. Uh, we also have that therefore, let me give this a name. Um, uh, let me call it phi, uh, so this is phi of st. So we get that therefore, uh, the exponential of phi is of positive type. That's because of course, we already showed that positive type functions, you can take products of them and you get positive type. And you can also take sums of them and you get positive type. And so therefore just writing out the exponential looking at its Taylor series, you see that you get a limit of positive type functions, which is again, positive type, All right? So the exponential of phi is uh, positive type. But on the other hand, we also have that this map, this map which takes uh, S and T and sends it to the exponential of negative C R naught S, times the exponential of negative C uh, T R naught uh, is of positive type. Uh, and why is that? that because, that's because we see that this map here, so this is a function from S into a one dimensional Hilbert space. Uh, mainly the reals. And so here we have their inner product, their product in the reals is the inner product in the reals. And so here we have exactly uh, the inner product of this function of S with the same value of T. So this is a, is a positive type. So now we have here, this map is a positive type. 
And this map right here is of positive type. And so therefore their product is of positive type, but their product is exactly the exponential of negative C. So therefore, exponential of negative C is T. So this is equal, let me give this an, another name. This is called phi tilde. So this is equal to phi of ST times phi tilde of ST is a positive type. Right, but of course now, so that shows that the exponential of negative C is a positive type. But of course, if you multiply C by any positive number, you again get a conditionally negative type function. And so again, the exponential of that is conditionally negative type. Um, so therefore, for all A greater than zero, the exponential of negative A C is T is a positive type. That finishes the argument. Um, so, okay, so we're a little rushed at the end there, but uh, all the details are there. Uh, and the nice thing about this is that now we see that we have a connection between co-cycles, conditionally negative type function, and, uh, and semigroups of positive type functions. And we already know that uh, positive type functions have a connection to coefficients of representations. Uh, which are connected to property T. And so therefore, we're, we can combine all this thing and we can prove this next theorem, which we'll prove, uh, we'll prove on Monday. And that is that if gamma is a group and sigma is a subgroup of gamma, so then the following are equivalent. One, that the pair has relative property T, has relative T. Two, so relative T meant that whenever we had almost invariant vectors, we had a sigma invariant vector. Condition two says that we can actually get that invariant vector as close to the almost invariant vectors as we wanted. So if pi mapping gamma to U of H is a representation uh, with C n, say, almost invariant, meaning that uh, pi of t c n minus c n and norm goes to zero for all t in the group. Uh, so then we get that the projection onto the space of sigma and variant vectors of Cn is very close to Cn as it goes to infinity. So this says more than just that there exists uh, an invariant vector for sigma. This says that the invariant vector or you can find an invariant vector in sigma that's very close to your original almost invariant sequence. So this gives extra information. Uh, three, if phi n mapping gamma to the complex numbers are of positive type, and phi n converges to one pointwise, then phi n restricted to sigma converges to one uniformly. So if you have positive type functions which converge pointwise, then they converge uniformly. Uh, sorry, I don't have enough room to fit four and five on this page, so I'll have to move on to the next page. Four, that every uh, conditionally negative type function function on gamma is bounded uh, when restricted to sigma. Okay. 
sigma n5 every co-cycle uh, for every representation of gamma is bounded when restricted Sigma. All right, so these five conditions will all be equivalent to relative property T. And of course, when sigma is equal to gamma, then you get uh, they're all equivalent to property T for gamma. Uh, and we'll say, we'll show that uh, five has a, another interpretation in terms of vanishing or non vanishing of, of cohomology. Uh, we'll show that bounded cocycles are exactly the trivial cocycles. Uh, any questions? Oh, yes, I have about the second one of the disequivalence condition. Yes. Oh, thank you. Uh, is this projection H sigma? Yeah, so this uh, element of V of H? Yes. Yeah, it's the orthogonal projection onto this. Uh, so, of course, H sigma is the space of invariant vectors. So this is the orthogonal projection. Projection. Oh, so this, ah, oh, oh, I see, thank the you. Space of uh, sigma invariant vectors. So it is an orthogonal projection, so it's definitely in B of H. Uh, you can see pretty easily that the space of sigma invariant vectors is a closed subspace. So we have this orthogonal projection onto a closed subspace. And we do have a seminar in 10 minutes for those of you who are interested in attending the seminar. Brent Nelson is speaking. Uh, so you're more than welcome to look at the subfactor seminar webpage and you can find a link to the Zoom meeting for that. I have one question regarding the, uh, the answer. Can I the ask proof. another question? Uh, wait, uh, so go ahead, uh, maybe Julio, you started first and then we'll go to Koichi. Okay, uh, the second to last line of the last group, mm -hmm. how do you get that equality between okay. the exponential and yes. the... Uh, yes. It should just follow directly if we take uh, x. Uh, oh, sorry, you're right. Of course, I should exponentiate. Thank you. Uh, equal exponential. There, that should look better. So here I notice that the exponential is positive type. And in the previous one, that like the the exponent the that is yeah. So here we notice that this phi tilde is of positive type here, and here we notice that the exponential of phi is of positive type here. So therefore, the product of these two is of positive type. But okay. why is the phi tilde the phi tilde of positive type? Uh, this is because we can rewrite this. This is nothing but the inner product of eta s with eta t, where eta s is exponential of negative c r naught s, which is a real number with the trivial representation. Mm. I guess here that's a set, no representation. But it's a real number, so in particular, this is a Hilbert space. Okay. 